Welcome everyone to our impromptu Ranchers Thursday lunchtime series. Uh, I'm Paul Beck. I'm a state extension beef cattle specialist located at Stillwater. I'm here with Dave Lawman and Dr. Rosalind Biggs. Y'all want to introduce yourselves? Yeah, David Lawman, extension uh, beef cattle specialist, uh, working the cow calf and stalker area and uh, have a split extension and research appointment. Good afternoon. I'm Rosalind Biggs. I am coming from you lot coming to you live, I suppose, from the Oklahoma Youth Expo. We've got lots of good 4 H and FFA members here today and uh, in Oklahoma City, and it is raining as a good update for at least part of the state. I am a beef cattle extension specialist housed within the College of Veterinary Medicine. So um, I started getting phone calls about some uh, pretty severe bloat outbreaks on Sunday night. Uh, that continued uh, uh, through uh, Monday and into Tuesday. And um, we had a planning meeting for a, another uh, activity. And I, at the end of it, I, I brought up the issues that we're having across the state. And uh, it, uh, I brought up, you know, what, what we could potentially do to cover this topic. And it, it's a reflection of the quality of the team of individuals I get to, to work with, um, where we can, you know, uh, basically from Tuesday afternoon to, to Thursday, uh, organize and, uh, uh, advertise a, uh, uh, meeting and, and, uh, you know, even have people like Dr. Biggs that's offsite, that's actually doing other activities that's willing to step in. So, um, very proud to be a member of this team that can, can, uh, uh, do something that this quick to, to help with a current, uh, problem. Dave, did you have some announcements we needed to make before we get, kicked off? Sure. <clears throat> uh, the, I guess the main thing I wanted to mention, uh, you know, the one that if you had registered for the lunchtime series that begins next week, uh, I don't have it right in front of me, I guess it's the 20, 23rd. Um, just remember that you, sh you should have received a registration link uh, from Zoom for that meeting, and that's the link you'll need to use to join that particular uh, series. The link you're using here today will not work for it. So just, just keep that in mind. If you get confused or you lose that email, you can always just register again and it will send you another one, no problem. That's about all I wanted to mention. We have a, a good lineup. Uh, people in far eastern Oklahoma probably won't be real excited about that because life is good over there. Uh, but it, it deals with, you know, the ongoing going conditions of drought and potential resolutions. We hope to get some rain. Paul and others are going to cover uh, summer annual uh, forage production and tips about how to help make that successful and so on. And so, and then uh, just some really good presentations. Robert Hodgen from the King Ranch, really excited about his presentation. And that's the last one in that series there in mid eight. Thank you, Dave. Um, I'm going to go ahead and kick off talking about some of the forage conditions and uh, what's got us into this uh, issue and then some preventative feeding. And then we'll let uh, Dr. Biggs uh, finish up with some more treatment options and, and more specifics on, on what to do in, in the emergency situations that, that we're starting to see. So what we've seen um, is, you know, quite a lot of bloat um, and, and the bloat where, it, you know, the etiology of it or the causes of it are, are, are kind of varied and, and sort of specific, um, although it can happen throughout the year or, or and on different, uh, you know, species of, of grass it's, or, or legumes, it's most closely tied to, to wheat pasture in, in Oklahoma, uh, also uh, grazing legumes like 
uh, alfalfa or or air leaf clover. A lot of these other Persian clover are, are a lot more bloat provocative than, than some others. Um, a lot of it has to do with forage comp conditions, whether it's chemical composition, uh, maturity, uh, uh, fertility in the, in the background of, of the production of that forage. Uh, it also can be tied to weather, stocking rates, and, and other management. Um, Essentially, frothy bloat is a buildup of ruminal gases that occurs when production of that gas is greater than the expulsion of, of the gas, and that happens through a belching or erectation. In wheat pasture or other small grains, it's caused by a stable foam formation formed from a slime layer uh, that's the result of the soluble proteins and soluble carbohydrates uh, being released into the rumen. Uh, and it, whenever conditions are right and there's a lot of soluble protein uh, and, and not enough fiber in, in the mat to keep the rumen turnover as it should be, these gases that's released naturally from the, the rumen fermentation uh, percolate through that slime layer and, and it can go up and block the esophageal orifice and trapping the gas. Uh, if you look at this picture, uh, this is kind of a, a classic example. We have uh, several steers here that are uh, bloated, but in the same conditions, we have steers that are not bloated. And it can be highly individualized, uh, and it could just happen very rapidly. So uh, you might treat these uh, at some point, sometimes you might treat these three and then come back in the afternoon and, and find this other steer uh, uh, bloated or, or, or uh, even dead from bloat. So it's a, it's a very rapid uh, problem and you know, 15 or 20 minutes uh, may be the difference between non-bloated and, and death from that bloat in very severe conditions. Um, so the group of calves on that previous slide were gathered in pen whenever the producer saw uh, the bloated condition and about a third of the calves in this herd were, were bloated. Uh, they brought those calves up um, to get them off from the wheat field and, and start some treatments. And this calf had come all the way across the, the field and went to the water trough and, and stuck his head in the water trough and started uh, or was going to drink and then just died right there. So, you know, it can uh, block off the, you know, once it starts uh, swelling, that rumen can take, you know, way, uh, away from the uh, pulmonary system and they lose their ability to breathe and then uh, they'll die from suffocation. So this is a... a figure that I got from a, a publication that uh, Dr. Gerald Horn put together back in 1977 that just kind of outlines um, all the factors that go together um, that uh, affect plant growth and, you know, forage maturity. And then those, you know, in turn uh, go into the incidence of bloat. Um, you know, soil fertility, if we're looking at uh, well, well-managed pastures, we're putting on more fertilizer, our proteins will be higher in the plant, and a lot of the more of those will be the soluble proteins because fertility decreases maturity um, as we're increasing nitrogen. Uh, the growing conditions, um, you know, whether it's moisture and temperature and then changes in that moisture and temperature um, all affect the, the accumulation of forage growth as well as stocking rate. Um, we can do some different things with stocking rate to decrease our incidence of bloat. And that may be decreasing our stocking rate so we can increase the age of accumulated forage growth, therefore increasing the fiber or increasing the stocking rate, therefore decreasing the ability of that animal to quickly consume a, a lot of forage. But 
uh, neither of those work all the time. The age of accumulated forage growth goes into forage maturity, which is tied to the water content, the fiber content, and the soluble nitrogen fractions. And, and those, if we have high, high levels of water, low levels of fiber, and high levels of soluble nitrogen, those will tend to increase our incidence of load. Here's the forage curve from uh, about 10 years of research that we've conducted in uh, the central United States. Uh, the, this is the uh, protein and the uh, TDM concentrations of wheat pasture from November through May. Um, notice that at all times, uh, the protein requirements are much higher than the protein requirements needed for a, uh, this blue line shows the, uh, the protein and, and energy requirements of a calf gaining two and a quarter pounds a day. So protein is always going to be in excess of that cow's requirements until it starts maturing in May uh, or late May. Um, energy um, starts becoming limiting as it gets more fibrous whenever it starts maturing. But notice that we have an uptick going into February and March in, in many situations. And most of our uh, bloat, uh, even though it can occur throughout the fall and winter, most of the bloat is associated with that uh, re increase in regrowth in late February and early March, like it, like it was this year. Um, this is also from that publication from Dr. Horn in 1977, where it shows the, the bloat and the non-bloat uh, the forage conditions from pastures that where they observed bloat and where they didn't observe bloat within the same year. And this is from nine different uh, non-bloated pastures and about the same number of bloated pastures or cattle where, where bloat occurred. So um, dry matter was much lower in, in where bloat occurred. Uh, NDF was, was much lower where bloat occurred. Our protein levels was, was much higher where we have bloat. And the solubility of the protein was much higher, both as a percent of dry matter uh, and a percent of total nitrogen. So, you know, thus all those conditions um, go together uh, to create a bloat provocative uh, situation. Non-protein nitrogens are also soluble and rapidly available. Um, one thing to note that the soluble carbohydrates were actually lower because we had so much higher crude protein content. Uh, the soluble carbohydrates may not uh, be higher, but our lack of fiber from that immature forage is, is also a key in that. Uh, fiber um, stimulates the rumen to contract. So if we have a, a, a grain diet or a very high quality forage diet, we don't have e enough scratch factor in the rumen to, to stimulate contractions. And that uh, can also help lead to these issues. Uh, this shows the, um, the mineral concentrations of uh, a wheat forage on the average um, over uh, several years from the Dairy One Forage Laboratory. And this mirrors closely with a lot of the results that we've seen in Oklahoma and the uh, central United States. Uh, calcium and uh, calcium is, is uh, and magnesium are both tied to muscle contractions. And uh, calcium is much lower than the requirements, and magnesium can be uh, marginal to over the or, or in excess of requirements or meeting those cattle's requirements. But when we look at other uh, elements in there, phosphorus and potassium, they interact to uh, affect the magnesium uh, uh, metabolism. So um, in many instances, we may have marginal magnesium um, 
not only for a cow, you know, we think of grass tetany when we look at the magnesium content of our wheat forage uh, and, and its impact on grass tetany, but also uh, it may be marginal for uh, a growing beef steer as well. So um, those two uh, elements are, are of major concern when we're looking at uh, wheat pasture and since those two elements are uh, tied to muscle contraction, you know, there's uh, some evidence that um, the grass tetany potential of a wheat forage has also been tied to the uh, bloat potential of those forages. Uh, there's uh, some other research uh, from the 70s uh, at Fort Reno and at, at, at the Bushland USDA stations that uh, showed the same conditions were present where they saw a lot of grass tetany and bloat, and that's tied to the mineral concentrations as well. So when one other situation, you know, I mentioned the fiber uh, content uh, of the wheat forage, uh, that leads us to, to think that, that uh, uh, feeding some hay or uh, straws may uh, help to add that scratch factor back to the rumen um, because of that low fiber affecting you know, rumen motility. Um, the added fiber can also slow the passage rate, increase ruminal retention time uh, to help increase digestion of, of the wheat forage. Um, but there was uh, work by Terry Mater uh, when he was a Gerald Horn's graduate student back in the 80s, where they fed wheat straw or sorghum sudan hay to calves grazing wheat pasture. And, and they showed a real low consumption of those forages uh, from you know, 0.15 to four tenths of a pound per day of, of the wheat straw. Uh, sorghum sedan were about 0.4 to 0.9 pounds per day. So very low consumption of those uh, forages in that trial. Uh, they didn't impact uh, wheat forage intake, wheat forage digestibility, the passage rate of those diets or weight gain in that study. Um, and when they did see bloat during one of the trials that they reported, it was only observed in a short period in the last two weeks of the experiment, which was during March, which kind of rings a bell. You know, it's kind of the same situation we're in now. Uh, but there was no effect of that low quality roughage on the incidence and or severity of blood. Uh, so when uh, we're also looking at some other data that Dr. Horn uh, showed where feeding some silage uh, did have some positive associative effects uh, on gain, but there was no bloat during that. It, it may be an intake of that roughage, but also um, like we have this year, there are you know, uh, lots of these fields where we're seeing bloat this year um, in the last two weeks, uh, they had hay offered to the side. So um, it may help, you know, whenever we're in a subclinical bloat situation, but there's no evidence whenever we get into these uh, breakthrough bloat episodes that uh, roughage is going to be a cure-all or uh, much of a uh, benefit. Um, We've talked a lot about feeding menensin or uh, rumensin to decrease bloat. Um, this research is from a, 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 a publication that Dr. Horn had in 2005, and it's from uh, some research that Steve Paisley did when he was Gerald's graduate student back in the late 90s. Um, but they had some cannulated steers that were out on a, an experiment uh, comparing. Um, uh, no ionophore, uh, monensin, or lasalicid um, to those steers. The uh, 
number of steers that bloated, there was four steers on each of those treatments, the uh, rumen cannulated steers, they were basically on a digestion study. Um, all four of those steers in the control and the lasalicid treatments um, were bloated, uh, and only two of the other steers did have bloat, um, and that was only for a couple of days. And the bloat score for the Benenson was, was much lower um, than for the controls or the Lasalicid steers. Uh, it was only a bloat score of, of one, which is a slightly distended uh, compared to a, a three or a four, uh, which is where those cattle, you know, completely look like an egg, egg shape. Uh, so um, this, this does show that Benenson can help with the incidence and, and uh, uh, severity of that bloat. Uh, here also is uh, uh, some uh, overview studies of using rumensin um, for bloat provocative pastures, whether it's uh, legumes or, or wheat pasture. Um, this shows the incidence of bloat and uh, there's uh, several studies and every one of them did show a decrease in the uh, amount of bloat that was, was seen. And whenever you put that together, uh, it decreased bloat by about 20%. Um, and likewise, similar to what we saw with, with Dr. Horn's uh, research, um, we showed a decrease of the severity of, a, of about one uh, bloat score. So instead of a three, uh, some of these showed a, a bloat score of, of two, and uh, instead of a two, a lot of them showed a bloat score of one. So, you know, this, you know, over time, over a lot of different experiments, this shows it does work, but it's not going to be a complete curative. Um, Lastly, as far as uh, uh, trying to moderate or, or, or prevent it bloat from occurring, there's paloxylene, and a lot of us have used this. It's been labeled for the prevention and, and control of wheat pasture and legume boat bloat for over 60 years. It's a, essentially a surfactant that disrupts, disrupts foam forma formation and releases the trapped black gases. Uh, it's labeled for feeding at one to two grams per 100 pounds of body weight, uh, and it's commercial available in a variety of forms. There's uh, feed additives, top dresses for concentrates, mineral supplements, blocks, and liquid feeds. Uh, but it must be consumed daily. So uh, a lot of what we're seeing, uh, and I've heard reports of bloat blocks or bloat supplements being available on a free choice basis to to a lot of steers for the entire uh, season, and they're still having some breakthrough bloat cases. That's probably indicating that certain animals are not consuming those uh, products uh, because they must be consumed uh, fairly uh, uh, consistently uh, by the animal for it to have control. Here's an example of, of feeding paloxylene. There's, uh, uh, very common to, to see these bloat blocks being put out. Um, it's a 6.6% .6 paloxylene. Um, it's not a mineral uh, supplement it's a, or a protein supplement. It's got, you know, very little uh, nutritional benefit other than just the paloxylene carrier. Uh, the, the recommended dose is eight tenths of an ounce for 100 pounds of body weight. So that'd be eight ounces for a thousand pound cow or four ounces for a 500 pound steer. Uh, these are essentially 33 pound blocks. Um, so there's 132 steer days per block. And, you know, looking at prices, retail prices uh, that, that I surveyed uh, quickly in the last couple of days, it's about a quarter to 33 cents per, per head per day. So our current recommendation, um, we need to feed a mineral supplement designed for wheat pasture continuously that would supply high calcium, uh, low phosphorus and, and 
potassium, um, moderate magnesium, you know, two to 4% magnesium for a stalker calf would be adequate, uh, as well as uh, copper. Copper is usually deficient in our uh, wheat pasture as well. Uh, I submit we need to include menensin in, in any supplement that we're gonna provide. This in increases gains and does decrease the incidence and severity of bloat. And even though it doesn't prevent all of it, it does, if we're decreasing the severity, allow us time to, to see those animals before bloat death occurs and gives us time to provide alternative cures. Um, I also uh, indicate that, you know, feeding a moderate quality paddle, palatable hay um, may be of benefit, especially uh, before we start seeing a large amount of bloat. It really doesn't hurt anything and it does provide some peace of mind. So uh, there's a lot to be said for that. Also, um, I'm recommending to be prepared to take action. Bloat will not wait for you to turn to run around trying to figure out what to do uh, and go find the product and get it back to the to the cattle. Um, you know, we can have a very rapid onset of, of death losses uh, with with bloat whenever it becomes an issue. So, like I said before, and probably um, maybe said it too much, it's an issue of of you know, plant um, chemical composition um, from those soluble plant cell contents. Uh, the rapid growth that we saw over the last few weeks when we actually had a few, little bit of moisture and some nice growing condition uh, allows for high rates of intake of a very high quality forage product. Then we have a frost after a few mild days of, of growth um, we get ruptures of cell walls, um, and this, especially if it's behind a frontal system, when, when the front comes through, cattle will pull back on intake, and then the weather gets nicer, uh, after that frost, they'll go out and, and eat a large amount of feed or forage because they're hungry, uh, and their forage intake rate can, can be astronomical. Um, this you know, low fiber, fiber content is tied to reduce ruminal activity along with minerals that are important with muscle contractions. So with that, I can address any questions we have uh, or we can move on to Dr. Biggs. Just as a reminder for our participants today, if you're interested in asking a question, you can put that either in the chat or you can use the q and I'm not seeing any right now, Dr. Beck. I'm hoping we'll have a few questions. Uh, oh, we do have one question. Let's take a look there. Question is for you, Dr. Beck, and you, you'll probably be reading this as, just as I'm reading it aloud to the group, but I know you've had some experience with fescue. What about bloat? Can it happen on fescue pasture as well? We, we normally don't consider bloat to, uh, or fescue to be a, um, uh, a big bloat provocative forage. It, it can be, especially when it's uh, you know, uh, rapidly growing. Um, Usually when we, we see these conditions in the spring, it's already got a lot of uh, forage accumulation from the previous fall. Uh, so it'll, you know, that just, even if it's all leaf, that plant age and fiber content uh, makes it where it's not as conducive to bloat. Now, there are situations where it could be because, you know, if that fresh forage regrowth of Tall fescue is is very similar uh, to the quality of wheat pasture, so uh, it potentially can, especially with our non-toxic varieties. One of the I don't know good things about those toxic varieties is it does decrease intake, uh, does increase decrease decreases intake and decreases uh, intake rate. So it's you know there's a lot of factors that go together to make it where it's not as bloat provocative. 
We did have another question about recommendations for paloxylene blocks over the next several weeks. Um, we'll probably touch on that again in some of my slides, Dr. Beck, but what, what are your thoughts on that? Yes, I'm, um, especially if we have, can get intake of them. They're, they're very palatable, but the key to any of these self-ed products is intake. Uh, so if we're assured that we can get consistent and uniform intake of all the individuals, then that it would be uh, time and money well spent. It, does, it takes a lot of blocks to equal the, the cost of a dead uh, calf this, this year, for sure. All right, so let's take one more question, Dr. Beck, if that's all right by you. We'll slide uh, over to my, my set, and then we'll come back and maybe catch up all, all other questions. Um, okay. There seems to be in... It seems to be more of uh, seeing bloat as a function of numerous cloudy days, the lack of sunshine almost. Um, any impact uh, on, on these kind of conditions? Certainly we see bloat, you know, those last few weeks in February into March, we're seeing our temperatures jump up, <laughs> dip down. Um, what about cloud coverage, lack of sunshine, et cetera, on growth patterns and what's your uh, what's your stance on that? Yeah, we've we've seen that and we talk about it a good bit. Um, I think what that is tied to would be accumulation of soluble proteins, uh, much like you'd see with uh, cloudy days and nitrites during the summer in, in Sudans and that type of thing. It's, uh, you know, lack of sunshine does decrease in forage growth. Uh, so that, that could potentially impact the, the amount of soluble proteins. And, you know, like I showed that soluble protein content is very closely tied to the, to the bloat uh, occurrence. All right, well, thanks, Dr. Beck. I'm gonna pull my slides up if that's all right with the group. All right, you should be seeing those now. I'm gonna talk a little bit about options for dealing with bloat and, and specifically when it comes to treatment, you're gonna hear a little bit of repetition uh, based on what Dr. Beck just relayed, but I think that repetition is worth kind of driving these points, points home as we, we look at the occurrence of bloat that we're seeing uh, particularly uh, right now here in Oklahoma. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the different kinds of bloat and why that matters when we're looking at treatments, um, particularly emergency treatments, why we may have some cautions there. And then we're going to reiterate what our preventatives uh, are, are going to look like. I want to give a, a huge shout out to Dr. Meredith Jones-Cook, who uh, in, is on vacation and even on vacation. Just as Dr. Beck mentioned, we've got a great group amongst those in animal science, in vet med, um, and then across extension. Dr. Jones is one of our food animal uh, clinicians at the veterinary school, kindly shared uh, a number of her resources as well as images. Uh, because as you might guess, when oftentimes when you're dealing with, with these types of situations, nobody's taking pictures and videos. And so, um, especially when we turn this around so quickly, Dr. Jones is very, very helpful in getting this put together. So we wanna talk a little bit about the clinical signs. And I think, uh, you know, most experienced cattlemen are gonna be real comfortable with that left-sided rumen distension. But we can also see, you know, difficulty breathing, um, open mouth breathing in particular. It's not uncommon to see these calves salivate. Uh, in fact, at OIE yesterday, we had a calf um, bloating for much different reasons than these that we're seeing uh, here on wheat pasture, but that calf was salivating quite a bit, the one that I took a look at yesterday. We'll also see increased heart rate. They can also be anxious or aggressive. Uh, we, we're seeing they're really uncomfortable, right? Uh, they cannot get that pressure, pressure relieved, and you may see them frequently posture, um, you know, urination, defecation, frequent attempts there. And then ultimately we're leading to, um, if we get into that real extreme, uh, extreme part of the, of this condition, 
we lead to sudden collapse and death uh, due to cardiovascular collapse. So again, we've got two major types of, of bloat. And so I think it's worth mentioning the kind that we're seeing here on our wheat pastures in Oklahoma is going to be frothy bloat. And so if you don't distinguish anything else that, that I talk about today, let's make it clear on frothy bloat versus a free gas bloat and, and how that impacts our treatments. We see this frothy bloat again, as Dr. Beck mentioned, wheat pasture, we also see it in legumes, uh, clovers, we can see it with some finishing rations and it is really the most common type that we, that we will see. Our free gas bloat, we see those generally more of a feedlot issue excess carbohydrate ingestion. We can also see it with certain um, chokes, for instance, intraluminal, esophageal foreign body, the kind of class one in Oklahoma is that horse apple choke in that cow, right? We can also see it in extramural compression. Uh, we can see some bloats where we're, that are, that are more age related or condition related, such as the pregnancy, or if we've got a tumor, for instance, it's impeding uh, passage through but those are, those are going to put us in a different category than what we're talking about on the wheat pastures that we're seeing right now. So just wanted to provide some images. Uh, Dr. Jones is very kind, as I mentioned before, to share these. You know, this frothy bloat, we're looking here where we've got froth. It's, it's got those gas particles uh, trapped in, in that liquid, and it is, um, it's going to be all through that rumen versus the free gas bloat. Um, that most, most folks should be familiar with, where we think of uh, kind of a gas pocket at the top of that rumen, followed by that fiber mat, and then our um, more liquid ingesta below that. So when we're talking about, and I'm just going to concentrate on frothy bloat treatments here, um, we're looking to get a tube passed on those calves. And really, when it comes to treatment, when it comes to and we're not getting into the preventative, we'll get to the preventatives here in a minute as far as looking at the group, but we need to be able to treat those calves on an individual basis. And it becomes, I mean, I understand what I'm saying, you know, wheat pasture conditions, um, having the facilities to treat one of these guys uh, on an individual basis becomes hard, but you've got to balance that with you know, what are, what are risk and um, how to accurately provide some treatment options. So we want to get a tube passage. We're looking for a, a large bore tube. Anytime we're talking about passing a tube, I would be remiss if we did not talk about placement of that tube. We've got a, we've got a cap that's stressed. We have to make sure that we get that tube down into the rumen and that we're not getting it into the lungs. The worst thing we can do is, is put, uh, in particular, any of our products um, into the lungs. That sure enough will equal, uh, that's bad news for that calf, regardless of the bloat. So we want to make sure we get that tube passed and we get it into the, the GI tract, down the esophagus, into the rumen, so that we can um, make some assessment and then apply appropriate treatments from there. We want this, the star here on this calf is about where we want the end of that, end of that tube to sit. And um, again, I want you to use caution when you're, when you're passing those tubes, make sure we're getting it into the right, into the right place. It is difficult as a general rule on a normal calf to get that tube into the lungs. However, these calves are stressed. Again, we'll remember those clinical signs about open mouth breathing. Um, we, we can see some things happen, especially if we're, if we're trying to do things fast and quick. We want that tube placed in the GI tract, not in the lungs. So we want to look at paloxylene as, a, as an option. There are other surfactants, DSS, for instance, um, that will be labeled for that. But we'll talk a little bit more about the paloxene uh, as we go on into the additional slides. We also uh, want to talk a little bit more about trocars. I want to mention first and foremost, I think, you know, we've, we've seen on various veterinary related television shows, you know, we're, we're getting in there. We want to put a trocar in immediately. Everybody wants to save the day. Let's put a hole in that calf side, put a hole in the room. And that to me is an absolute last ditch effort. That is not something we should be reaching for first. And in most cases of frothy bloat, um, again, we don't have that big gas pocket. 
we've got we've got ingesta, we've got a froth. Think of those bubbles uh, in in the kitchen sink. That's kind of uh, the consistency that we're dealing with. We've got this slime that is not something that is going to go through a needle easily and is not something that a trocar uh, in many cases is going to relieve. So trocars and frothy bloat are not always um, our best option. Again, that is something I'm reaching to because I have run out of treatment options and I am really in, uh, death is imminent in that case uh, for that cat. So paloxylene, you'll notice again, this is no, um, I don't make brand recommendations, but Therabloat is labeled uh, as far as bloat goes. We're gonna give one ounce. These are not very big bottles. Uh, you know, we can't, can't really get them any bigger than this two ounce bottle, but those calves less than 500 pounds, we're gonna give one ounce. Those over, two, over 500 pounds, you're gonna have two ounce. Those directions are right there on the bottle. We wanna follow those labeling directions. Again, I wanna give you a bit of caution um, on, on these treatments. We got to make sure we get our dilutions correct on this, and so uh, you want to have these plans in place before you sure enough have a calf that needs to be treated. So I, I cannot encourage you. We got a, a, a number of veterinarians on the line, really accomplished veterinarians, experienced veterinarians that are on the call today, and so want to make sure you're having these discussions, especially if you're running calves right now on wheat pasture. Of what do I do? What are what's the plan? And um, we can come up with that treatment plan, have everything on hand. Hopefully we don't need it, but we've discussed that before we have an emergency. Again, with this paloxylene, we wanna follow the labeling instructions. We wanna dilute it. And in my, in my hands, I wanna give it through that stomach too. I've got a lot of caution with using a drench. This is, um, you know, appears to be, as some of you all might go, well, that looks like a dairy cow. And, and that's true. This is the best picture I had readily available to me of, of one that's open mouth breathing. My concern with giving a drench and a drench only and not putting that phylloxylene right into the, into the rumen on top of that froth is I get it on one like this, that I get it with a drench potentially in her lungs or his lungs, and that gives us um, bad outcomes. So again, uh, we, we've got to talk about, about trocars, but it's one of those things that it's not always useful. We want to proceed with an incredible amount of caution, and it is something that we want to have veterinary intervention and discussion with. You know, I think folks are, they, they always want to be the, the, the lifesaver, the cowboy reaching for that pocket knife. I'm going to fix the problem. And uh, my concern is that we create more problems, particularly on these frothy bloats. If we dump a bunch of that slime right into the abdomen of that calf, we've, we've not got ourselves really any farther ahead than we were. So these are just some images of trocars. And, and again, one more image of, of bloat and um, trying to solidify that in your brain. If for some reason you're not comfortable with that, uh, we've got that left-sided uh, distension and uh, we teach our veterinary students, we're looking for an apple shape, right? We're looking for a, a real round kind of shape all the way, all the way through. So additional management practices, and this gets us kind of more into the prevention discussion. And so I want you to be, I want you to be thinking about that as we're turning these calves out, particularly stalkers out on wheat pasture, we want to turn. We want to turn them out full. We don't want to turn them out hungry. You heard that from Dr. Beck. Um, particularly if we have bad weather and they've, you know, backed off intake and then they go out and gorge themselves. That many times is when we can see uh, see challenges. We may want to think about limiting access to that pasture. You know, do we have a way to get those get those animals out on that wheat pasture? for five, six, six to eight hours, that kind of thing, and then move them back, put them on grass hay. Um, we've got, you know, maybe some other kind of supplement, ideally with ionophore, as Dr. Beck told you, and a paloxylene additive there that we wanna, we wanna think about. As Dr. Beck mentioned, paloxylene comes in a variety of, um, a variety of forms. We've got it in feed additives. It also comes as a top dress. We've, we've talked about the bloat blocks. We had a question earlier about that, um, other mineral supplements and the liquid feed. The key in my mind in, in managing this condition is 
we've got to be monitoring these, these animals closely. It is not something where I can kick them out and then come back in four or five days and check on them. These are quick changes that can happen in some cases really within you know, a short period of time, hours uh, where they were normal and now they're bloated. And so we want to be monitoring those, uh, monitoring those animals on, you know, wheat pasture and other other potentially um, bloat potentiating pastures really, really closely. So uh, related to this in preparation for day today, I, I, I tried to do a um, at least a, a cursory level dig into the literature when it came on to, on to treatments and as well as preventatives. I will tell you there is, um, you know, there is some research ongoing and we're seeing this in many areas of animal health and certainly in most species within veterinary medicine of looking at microbiome. So when we talk about changes in the microbiome of, of how those organisms look under bloat conditions, we've got some research on that um, but not a lot when it comes to additional additional preventatives, additional treatments. Many of the veterinarians on the line are going, well, these are the ones, these are the ones we've been using for years. I unfortunately don't have any new um, new new golden tokens to offer you as far as what our treatments are are going, nothing new in the research that I could find. Um, we did we did find, you know, in other countries outside the U.S., there are some additives, in particular one that was interesting uh, that goes in water. But as Dr. Beck mentioned, with any of these preventatives, particularly the paloxylene and any other thing, we're, we're dealing with a group of animals here. It's got to be that intake. That intake becomes really, really important. I can have it out there. I could have something in the water, but if they will not if they will not drink it, if they will not eat it, it's not doing us doing us much good. And so we've got to be making sure that uh, particularly on those animals that perhaps are not the most aggressive in the group, that are not the leaders of the pack, that we are getting these preventatives uh, preventatives in there. This uh, this particular article I've got on this slide, um, not to end on on maybe a uh, let's call a suboptimal note, but uh, this was a survey of bloat uh, that came out of Australia. This actually just came out in, in March of this year. And in Australia, it was described they're grazing a lot of clover or clover dominant pastures. Um, they had two thirds of their producers that had seen bloat. Now, this is not unique to a certain segment or age group of, of the industry. Um, it's just had they seen it. And two thirds of them reported um, of those that had seen bloat two thirds of them had reported that they'd had preventative measures in place when they experienced losses. And in, in their, their degree of mortality of those that experienced bloat was about 5% mortality uh, within those that bloated. Uh, and their, their quote in there uh, was, of course, their preventatives may be, our, our current preventatives may be suboptimal. I think what you heard from, from Dr. Beck is, um, in most cases, we're looking at these preventatives that are, they're, they're sure not gonna hurt. And in most cases, um, we are hoping they're helping or at least decreasing the severity severity of the bloat. So uh, I wanna thank everybody for, for joining us today and happy to take, take any questions uh, that, that the group might have for Dr. Beck or myself. Dr. Biggs, Dr. Beck, one thing that uh, I thought of that hasn't come up yet today, what's your opinion, your thoughts on limit grazing or limiting access to wheat pasture in terms of a management strategy? I, I think for me, and I'll let Dr. Beck chime in here too, the thing about limiting that access has got to be they need to be consuming something else when they're not on that pasture, right? Like if we pull them off, but they're on a dry lot with nothing else to eat, we're, we're going to actually see, um, we're going to make it worse when we put them back out on, on the wheat pasture. Um, one other thing that, that I did not include in the discussion on these preventatives, uh, if we have folks that have not yet turned cattle out onto, onto wheat pasture, et cetera, 
is looking at having those preventatives, particularly that phylloxylene, those bloat blocks, the top dress, et cetera, not, not in the emergency situation, but again, as a preventative, we want to have those on board with those cattle about three to five days prior to getting them out um, on onto that pasture. Dr. Beck, what have I what have I missed? Uh, you, you didn't miss a thing. The uh, one of the producers that is on the on the webinar, or, or at least was earlier, uh, indicated they had pulled the cattle that were bloating off and onto a, a, a dormant a, a dormant uh, summer grasses, and then whenever they turned them back in the, the next day, uh, the bloat was even worse. So you know they they didn't really like what they were turned out onto. Um, and then they had a very high intake rate, probably when they got turned back out. Um, so, you know, if you're going to do some restricted access, like Dr. Big said, you know, make sure you have them on something palatable that they're going to consume. Um, uh, well, I do have a, another question that came back channel through email um, that's somewhat related. Uh, what is the role? Uh, if any, of saliva production uh, and how that plays into bloat? Well, certainly we can see, um, you know, when we're, when we're not having a ructation um, happen, that's, that's our main problem, right, with bloat period. And so uh, we can see some acid-base imbalances um, with, in particular, if we have an acidosis going on, most of the time that's going to be more of our... Uh, Carbohydrate-related bloats, but our salivation is gonna is gonna help us. And so when we have an obstruction like a choke, um, we're we're hitting it from both ends. To be honest, we're not getting the saliva where it needs to go, and we're not getting gas eructated out of the room either. That there was some research back in the early '80s when they were looking at some of those situations uh, uh, with bloat and saliva does uh, help with bloat and you know whenever we have a very high highly digestible forage they're not going to have to chew it they're not going to regurgitate that and chew their cut as much right. uh, so chewing is you know very closely tied to salivation and uh, that's one of the ways that providing you know our theory you know um, providing some uh, moderate quality forage may help with, with that by increasing uh, chewing and, and salivation if we can get enough intake of that. Uh, that could also be tied to some higher fiber type uh, byproduct foods as well. There's a question that came in on the chat. Do you have a video of placement of a stomach tube uh, into the rumen? I do not, unfortunately. Um, you know, I've, I've I wish I had, um, I reminded myself as I was starting to put this together uh, that we need to have, we need to have more videoing and, and images uh, when we have these, these kind of discussions. So, um, you know, I don't have a good video of, of stomach tube placement or, or trocar placement. The, the main thing I would encourage folks to do is have that discussion with their veterinarian as to, you know, the specifics come up with the, with the treatments and specific to your cattle in your operation, you're going to uh, you're going to hear me say that time and time again on on so many things we talk about with extension. But um, I don't unfortunately have any good videos um, to to share. Now we did have one other question in the chat, and I'm I'm going to take this. You're getting this one, Dr. Beck. I hope that's okay. Um, scratch factor feed ingredients. Do you have a rank list to help in this scenario other than other than hay? I know we've, you know, lots of folks are going, well, feeding hay is great, but I don't have any. And so um, what are what are some, maybe some of our other options we might want to consider? Um, well, the uh, effective fiber content of a lot of our byproduct feeds, it, it does have fiber in it, in it, and some of that is effective fiber as far as causing scratch factor, but it's not very high. Um, so it's um, going to be a little bit harder to, to come up with a list of other things that would cause uh, roughage uh, 
activity in the room. And uh, Dave, what what's your thoughts? Paul, oh, there's a, in chapter 17 in the Oklahoma Beef Cattle Manual, uh, that's the chapter that deals with nutrient value of feeds. And in that table, there's one column that's labeled PEF, which stands for physically effective fiber. And so that would be the, the ranking that I would list that I would point people to. It's not perfect. There's some of those feeds that do have a number in that column that we really don't know very much about, but it's the best that we have available. Uh, those, those numbers are ranked from zero to one. And so a one would be something like the uh, senescent standing summer forage, you know, in, in February, you know, it's very woody, high fiber content, very high scratch factor. And of course, a zero being more zero to 10, maybe, or 0 0.1, zero to 0.1, being something that's very low in effective fiber. So the Oklahoma Beef Cattle Manual, uh, chapter 17, would have a, a list that would be about as close as we could get to addressing that, that question. Excellent. I, I hope everybody got as much out of this as, as I did. And, and thank you for to my colleagues for helping us put this on in such short, short order. Um, uh, with that, um, look forward to seeing everybody on next week's uh, Rancher's Thursday lunchtime series. If you're not uh, registered for that, um, you can find the registration link in our chat uh, or go to uh, beef.okstate.edu to register for that series.